Um, but this week we're going to take a look at the very first, actually it's the first issue that he hits, and that is how to profit from your problems. Um, all of us in life are going to have problems, and this is kind of a how-to manual for the Christian life. And when you write a letter, one of the things that you do is you usually kind of ease into it. Hey, just thought I would ask how you were doing. Uh, the weather here has been horrible. It's been um, below zero. It's, uh, we've had some sickness around. That, you know, we kind of ease into the letters, you know. But not, not James. He doesn't do that at all. He gets right into it. And he talks about his subject. And he, and he lays a bomb on us in verse 2. Right off the bat, he, he just gets right into it. He's, it's like he's saying, okay, we're going to get right into this thing. We're not going we're not gonna, we're not gonna to sugarcoat this. We're going to get right into this. And I, and I kind of like that. I like that straightforward approach, but that's me. Um, I, I like that. I just figure the, 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 quickest point between, or the quickest way between two points is a straight line. You don't go up here and down here and up here, get around a little bit and then go over. It's, it's a straight line. And so, um, and then, so in verse 2, he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Let me read that once again. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. The key phrase is, because you know, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Your attitude is, uh, is determined by your understanding. Rejoicing is not just positive thinking, but based on some facts of life. Four facts of life that come from James and that will help you with your problems that you're going through right now. First fact, um, problems are inevitable. Problems are inevitable. They're going to happen. Scripture doesn't say, if you encounter problems, consider it joy, but whenever you uh, have problems. Consider it pure joy. Count on it. You're going to have problems. Uh, as a matter of fact, it says, in the world, you will have tribulation. Peter said, don't be surprised when you have problems. Count on it. Problems are not an elective in life. They are a required course. You have to have them. The second thing is, problems are unpredictable. I wish sometimes that I knew what was up ahead around the corner. But then there are times when I say, you know what, I don't think I could take that. I couldn't, I, I don't want that to happen. And so I don't want to be all knowing. I don't want to know what's going to happen a lot of times. I mean, I know what's finally going to happen in, in the book, but I, I don't want to know what's going to happen in my own life a lot of times. As a matter of fact, if I knew what was going to happen, I would, I would do my best to avoid that. But the scripture says I can, I'm not going to avoid it. The word face in Greek literally means to fall into unexpectedly. It is the same word used in the story of the Good Samaritan where the men fell among thieves. It was unexpected. Trials are not planned. We seldom can anticipate the problems we are going to experience in life. If we could anticipate them, we'd run the other way and we wouldn't get the benefit from them. They are unplanned and unpredictable when we at least expect them. That's what makes a problem a problem. Third thing, problems are of many kinds. Problems are of many kinds. They come in all shapes and they come in all sizes. Uh, one thing about problems, you don't get bored with them. They come in all kinds of ways. Have you ever tried to match paint? As a matter of fact, I remember it, you look out here in our hallway sometimes. Or don't look at it. Yeah, that's probably better. It's white. It's white paint. That's what it is. We go to the store and we say, we want white paint. They say, what kind of white paint? What do you mean, white? what kind of white paint? White paint is white paint. That's what we want. 
But they say, did you know, this was, this was what they told me at Lowe's or one of those places, did you know that white is one of the hardest colors to match? And I said, no. Yes, it is. But problems come, and in many shades and varieties, there are a variety of intensity. They vary in variety, they vary in duration. Some are minor inconveniences, some are major crises. The fourth thing is problems are purposeful. They have a purpose. Pain can be productive. Pressure produces suffering can accomplish something. It has value in our lives. What value? First of all, problems purify my faith. They purify my, he uses the word testing as testing gold and silver. You would heat them up to a very hot until the impurities, the dross, they called it, was burned off. And Job says, he has tested me through the refining fire and I have come out as pure as gold. The first thing trials do is they test our faith. They purify us. Christians are a lot like tea bags. You don't know what's inside of them until you drop them in hot water. Your faith develops when things don't go as planned. You see, planned, we have a way out. But when things are unplanned, so if you want to see the goodness in a person's life, Watch them in the unplanned things of life. Your faith develops when you don't feel like doing what's right. It purifies your faith. The second thing problems do for us is problems fortify my patience. I hate that. (laughs) The testing of your faith, the scripture says, the testing of your faith develops patience. He's talking about staying power, not passive patience, but staying power endurance, the ability to keep on keeping on, the ability to hang in there. The word here is literally the ability to stay under pressure. And we don't like pressure. And we do everything we can to avoid it. We run from it. We take drugs. We drink alcohol. We go to Disneyland. We get away from anywhere, anytime, pressure. If we hear about pressure, we don't want it. But God uses our problems and lives to teach us how to handle pressure, how to never give up. How does God teach your patience? By everything going your way? No, God teaches you patience in traffic jams. Did you hear me? God teaches us patience in traffic jams, in grocery lines, the waiting periods of our life. We live in a comfortable, convenient society. Everybody wants it and wants it now. If I can't have it now, forget it. Endurance is a rare quality. Third thing is, problems sanctify my character. They make me like Jesus. They help me mature. They help me grow. The testing of your faith produces perseverance that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. That's God's long-range goal. His ultimate goal is maturity. He wants you to mature in the Christian life. Character is the bottom line. So many Christians I talk to have absolutely no idea of God's agenda in their life. They don't know what's happening, and as a result, they are overwhelmed by their problems. God's number one purpose in your life is to make you like Jesus Christ. God is much more, now listen to this, God is much more interested in building my character than in making me comfortable. God is much more interested in building my character than making me comfortable. Through the word of God, John 17, 17 says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. James says the word makes us like Jesus. It builds our character. It matures us. But even if you read the Bible two hours a day, how many hours of your life are you not reading God's word? 22. Just did the quick math right there. I did good math. 
Through the circumstances of life, here's where James hits it right on the head. So many Christians I meet say, everything was going great when I first became a believer. Then all of these problems came into my life, and God doesn't love me any longer. Maybe I'm not a Christian. Maybe I wasn't really saved. Maybe I've really missed a boat. You are exactly where God wants you. You're in a character course, and he is making you more and more like Jesus all of the time. You see, the fight doesn't begin. I hate to tell you this. The fight doesn't begin until you become a believer. Because the devil's already got you. He just leaves you alone. You'll destroy yourself. You'll just, you'll just eat yourself up. It's just who you are, and you're so self-centered, and you're so egotistical, and you think you can do things on your own. You want to go ahead and go ahead and try and do things on your own, and so you do. And you try to do things on your own, and you mess up, and you mess up, and you mess up. Well, the devil's got you right where he wants you. But then you come, become a believer, and all of a sudden, you have all of the power of God, the very resurrection power of God, the power that raised Jesus from the dead. You have that power in your life. You have that at your fingertips, and he knows that. And then all of a sudden, you go and you stub your toe in some kind of way, and you go whining and crying and say, I don't think Jesus loves me anymore, and I don't think I'm a believer. Why? Because I stubbed my toe. Are you kidding me? The things that we give up our faith for is amazing to me. When you, when you weigh them in the balance, there is no weight. There is nothing compared to that. Listen to this. You are exactly where God wants you. You're in a character course. He's making you like Jesus. Together for good. If we love God and are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28 says, and 29 says this. For whom he did foreknow, he predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son of God. Why do all things work together for good? In order to make me like Jesus Christ, his Son. Amen. <laughs> I had a friend of mine, his name was Gene Vincent. And there was a, con there's a constant thing that goes on between do, sin do people sin every day in word, thought, and deed? And some people say yes, and some people say we can live above that. We're on that side of the, of the, of this, um, of the argument that we can live above that that God can give us the power to live above that. Now, when I'm talking about sinning, I'm not talking about missing the mark. What I'm talking about is a willful transgression against God's law. In other words, we do this to Jesus. Jesus asks us to do something, and we put up our fast, and we say, there is no way, no how that I'm going to do that. And so, therefore, we sin against God. Now, we believe that we can have the power not to do this in God's face. Um, so my friend, Gene Vincent, I was, almost forgot where I was at. I'm 58 almost now. A couple of weeks, I'll be 58. And I guess your brain goes at 58. So it's slowly creeping into that. So Gene Vincent... There was a, this guy was preaching, and he was preaching away, and he was, he was blazing away. And he said, I'm telling you that everybody has sinned and is sinning right now in their life. There is sin right now in your life. Everybody is sinning every single day in word, thought, and deed. And you all, all of you within this congregation are a bunch of sinners. And I want the hand of anybody that says they have not sinned today. Right now, today, Gene Vincent raised his hand like an idiot. <laughs> he said, I want to call you up here. Come up here. And he said, uh, he said this. He said, uh, the pastor said to him, 
You know, it was down in Louisiana. This is where they handle snakes and they shoot alligators and chew them. Right, chew them. And they, they do all that kind of stuff. And they said to him, so they called Gene up on the front and they said, now, now Gene, are you, you're, you're telling me that you have not sinned today? No, not that I know of. Said, well, you would know if you had. Have you done that? No, no, I haven't. He said, to mock Gene, he said, I want to show everybody within this congregation this is a little Jesus. This is a little Jesus. Gene didn't know what to say. He stood there, but he's quick-witted. He was quick-witted. He, uh, he lost, they say, a third of his brain by Agent Orange over in Vietnam. But man, oh man, if he lost a third of his brain, his two-thirds are working really good. So he's quick-witted. So he said to the pastor that called him up and embarrassed him in front of everybody, did you sin today? Did you have problems today with some kind of way? Did you do that? He said, yes, yes, I have. Yes, I had. Gene said, everybody, I want to introduce to you a little devil right here. <laughs> he wasn't welcomed into membership at that church. This is what you need to know. But God wants us to be Christ-like, you see. And when we say that, people get nervous about that. You mean to tell me God wants us Christians to be Christians? Imagine that. Think of that, that God wants us to be like his son. Christian. How do you handle your problems? First of all, you rejoice. You rejoice. The Bible says, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials. Don't misunderstand what he's saying. He's not saying fake it. Put on a plastic smile. Pretend. Be a Pollyanna. God never asked you to deny reality. He doesn't mean some kind of psychological pumped up based on nothing. He's also not talking about masochism. Good. I get to suffer for Jesus. Hallelujah. I feel so spiritual when I feel so bad. He's not having a martyr complex. We don't rejoice for the problem. We rejoice in the problem. We don't thank God for the situation. Why would I thank God for evil? But I thank God in the situation, and one of the most understood verses in the Bible is 1 Thessalonians, and everything give thanks for this is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus. So in the midst of trial, in the midst of temptation, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of all of those things, in the midst of financial setback, in the midst of all of those things, what do we do as believers? We're weird. We rejoice right in the middle of them. So believers at Grace Point, guess what? We can rejoice in the middle of zero temperatures. And the flu and bronchitis. Now, I do know this that everything I preach about, I'm tested on. <laughs> it happens every time, I'm telling you. So, if next week I call in, just remember I might not have a voice, but I'm rejoicing in the midst of it. Hallelujah. Remember that. So in the middle of that, if you know what God's will is for your life, it's simple. In everything, give thanks. You didn't hear me. If you want to know what God's will for your life is, it's simple. In everything, give thanks. It says in everything give thanks. Why? 
It means we can thank God because we know that He can even take the bad in our lives and turn it around and make good out of it. What's the difference in all of that? Here's the difference in the whole deal. Your attitude. Consider it pure joy. The word consider means deliberately look at. It means to evaluate, to make up your mind once and for all. And when I'm living in the present, I look forward to the benefits of this problem. Consideration is a choice. Although I cannot control the circumstances that happen to me in my life, I can control how I will respond to them. Viktor Frankl, the Jewish psychologist who spent time in the Nazi concentration camp in Germany, said, they stripped me naked. They took everything. They took my wedding ring, my watch. I stood there naked. And all of a sudden, I realized at that moment that although they could take away everything from me, my wife, my family, my possessions, they could not take away my freedom to choose how I was going to respond. You choose to rejoice in the situation. Psalm 34 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. From strange and unusual events, 1982, from the Encyclopedia Britannica, you guys got to listen to this. This is hilarious. I don't know where they get this stuff, but this is a funny, funny thing. Brian Heiss had more than his share of bad luck in July. His apartment in Provo, Utah, became flooded from a broken pipe in the upstairs apartment. The manager told him to go out and rent a water vacuum. That's when he discovered that his car had a flat tire. He changed it, went inside again, and called a friend for help. From the electric shock he got from the phone, he inadvertently ripped the instrument from the wall. Before he could leave the apartment a second time, a neighbor had to kick the door down because water damage had jammed it so tight. While all was going on, someone stole Heiss's car. But it was almost out of gas, so he found the car a few blocks away. But had to push it to a gas station where he filled up the tank. That evening, Heiss attended a military ceremony at his university. He injured himself severely when somehow he sat on his bayonet which had been tossed in the front seat of his car. Doctors were able to stitch up his wound, but no one was able to resuscitate four of Heiss's canaries who were crushed to death from the falling plaster. After Heiss slipped on the wet carpet and badly injured his tailbone, he began to wonder if God wanted me dead, but he kept missing. That's what I call a good attitude. (laughs) It's your choice to rejoice. It is your choice to rejoice. It is your choice to rejoice. It is our choice to rejoice. It is our choice to rejoice. It is our choice to rejoice. Listen to this. The second way to handle your problems is request. In other words, pray. All of the time, pray when you've got these problems. What do you pray about? Listen to what it says. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously. To all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. You ought to pray for wisdom when you're in the middle of problems. When should I pray for wisdom so you won't waste the opportunity to grow? If you don't learn, learn it this time, there will be one more lap around the desert. And God will give you another opportunity. Learn from the problem. Wisdom is seeing life from God's point of view. There is no situation of life that you can't learn from. And if you have the right attitude, don't ask why. Ask wait. Why is to purify your faith, fortify your patience, sanctify your character, but ask, what do you want to teach me in this problem, Lord? Finally, 
And really what it boils all down to, you guys, what is the way that I react to my problems? <laughs> As Aaron Rodgers said in a press conference, R-E-L-A-X. Relax. You can't do anything about it anyway. You think you can. You think you can handle situations. You think you can pro handle problems. You think you can get over them. You think you can leap ahead of them. You think you can, but I want to tell you, just relax. They're a natural part of our life. They're going to happen. It's going to happen. Problems are going to happen in life. That's just the way it is. But relax. When he asks, he must believe and not doubt, the scripture says. My heart breaks when I think of the heartache and the pain of people in our church. There are some people in this church that are going to be in God's Hall of Fame. Have you uh, ever noticed that a lot of times that some of the most godly people you know go through some of the hardest situations and trials and tribulations. Is Phyllis here today? Phyllis Elman? Is she here? No. She is? Debbie Townsend's here? No kidding. Debbie? Hi. Wow, I just saw you in the hospital room. And you're here this morning. Hallelujah. That's amazing. As you know, Debbie has stage four cancer. We were talking to a gal at Lowe's last night. We were at Lowe's. I try to stay away from there, and my wife spends a lot of money there. <laughs> so I try to stay away from there. And this gal said that she had cervical cancer. Um, seven years ago, she had seven years, seven years ago, she had cervical cancer, and she was in stage four. And they gave her very, very little time to. But she said, I've been cancer free for seven years. If the girl didn't think I was some kind of weird perv or something, I would have hugged her. But I thought to myself, what a testimony. My heart breaks when I see individuals within our congregation that are going through such things as Debbie and Phyllis and others are going through. But I do know this, that we will pray for them, we will expect God to work for them, and we, we believe in them with all of our heart, and God does miraculous, miraculous things in the midst of all of that. So what can we do? I mean, we go to the doctor. We do all we can. We do all of that. I, I believe in that. I believe in going to the hospital when I'm sick. I believe when my car breaks down, I take it to a mechanic. It's what I do. Um, but I also know that the final healing comes from that of the great physician, the one who made me. Pray for two things. Wisdom to understand the trial and faith to endure the trial. James said you need wisdom to know what's going on and faith to hang in there. Debbie, don't give up. Don't give up. Hang in there. Hang in there. God says the devil wants to use your problems to defeat you, but God wants to use those problems to develop you which will it be? Some of you are going through some tough times. 
It's pretty hard, but God cares. He cares about you very much. God sees everything you're going through. He's got your number. He says the very hairs on your head are numbered. For some, that's not too hard. There is a fantastic promise in James that says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. I don't think when we get to heaven, all the rewards will go to the pastors. As a matter of fact, I think very few will go to them. All the evangelists, they won't get any. <laughs> Billy Graham might have a few, though. I think we'll, the rewards will go to the people who quietly put up with difficult situations in their household, in their life, in their health, in their financial struggles. Those are the ones that I believe that God will bless in all eternity. The scripture says there will be a crown of life. Cast your cares upon him. I got to tell you something. Something that happened just in staff meeting. Chuck recognized it right away. He, goes, he says to me, your mind is going a mile a minute about how this pertains to this message, isn't it? I said, I'm rewrite, you're rewriting sermons. And I said, yes, I am right now. I was talking to them because last year we did this thing, this companionship with Jesus and everything was about Jesus and Jesus. And, and so I just kind of fall in love with Jesus, man. I, I just, and so I was expressing to the staff, I was saying, man, I really miss Jesus when I get outside of the Gospels. I just really miss him. I, I, because he's just so cool in the Gospels when he, like, I, I love Jesus when he runs into the Pharisees and, and he calls them a brood of vipers and whitewashed sepulchers. I love that because I'm like that. So I want to be like Jesus. <laughs> and so I said, you know, now I'm preaching in the book of James Sarah pipes up, and she says this. It was so cool. She said, you know, we're going through the Old Testament right now. And I said, yeah. And she said, on every lesson that we do, and this, this new lesson material they've got is amazing. It is great stuff, man. I mean, I looked at it, and the kids bring home. And parents, I want to tell you, if you're not working at that, with that stuff with your kids at home, don't expect us at church to be the only spiritual food that they get. Okay? Now, is that too hard? Is that harsh? Is that really harsh? I don't mean it to be. But don't expect this to be the only spiritual food that they get. So, so uh, Sarah says this. She said, in each one of our lessons... It says, at the very end, it says, what does Jesus have to do with this lesson? Where's Jesus? Thanks, Chuck. Good thing we got you wrong. <laughs> Where is Jesus in this lesson? And you know what? I got to thinking about that. You know in Genesis, you know what it says? It said, let us make man in our own image. That's what it said. Who's us? I mean, God said that. But who's he talking to? He's talking to, of course, Jesus the Son and God the Holy Spirit. He's talking to all the Trinity. Let us make man in our own image. Then I got to thinking about the the three Hebrew, Hebrew children that were in the fire, and they saw another guy walking in the fire. Who, who was that guy? That was Jesus. That's who that was. That was Jesus. He was, he was in the Old Testament. I thought, my goodness, Jesus is all over the book. He's all over the book. He's just all over the book. 
then then it it said that no no um no royalty could come through a prostitute and there was a gal by the name of Rahab that was a prostitute and guess whose lineage she's in Jesus <laughs> So he's in the Old Testament. I got to thinking. Jesus isn't separate from God. And if, if this is the inspired word of God, Father, Son, Spirit, then he is in everything. He is the culmination of everything we believe. He is the culmination of everything we believe. He is in every theology. He's in every story. He's in everything that we could possibly believe. Jesus is in the middle of all those things. So I got to thinking about this. Man, this is cool. This is awesome. So Where's Jesus in all our problems? He's right in the middle of them. That's where he's at. And when we have problems, guess who walks right in the center of them? In walks Jesus. What's going on here? I'll handle it. You just sit back and relax, Bubba. I've got this one covered. That's what I've got. You see, it's always about Jesus. Always, always, always about Jesus. Always. Even the Holy Spirit. When you talk about the Holy Spirit, they talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and that's been distorted down through the years and the gifts of the Holy Spirit and, and Shanana and see my tie, tie my tie and all that kind of stuff. You know what the main characteristic of the Spirit is? To point you to who? Jesus. To Jesus. Amen. To make you like who? Jesus. Jesus. So all of that is culminated in one single individual. So we make it so impossible. And guys get up here and blab for 40 minutes and they talk about the fact that here's the way that we handle our problems and this is what we do. Guess what we do? We just take our cares, every single one of them, every last one, and we wad them up in a ball and we throw them at the feet of Jesus and say, Jesus, you take care of it. Only Jesus can take care of it. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Woo! Hallelujah! I'm sorry, I, I'm back in Kentucky now. I, I keep forgetting that I'm not in Maine any longer and I've got to act sophisticated and stuff like that. But I want to tell you, that's just shouting ground. That is shouting ground. Jesus, Jesus works in the middle of our problems. It's Jesus who does it. It's Jesus who does it. It is always Jesus. It's always been Jesus. It always will be Jesus. And the answer to every problem is simply that simple. It's Jesus. Yeah. 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 Hallelujah. That's good right there, isn't it? Bye bye. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's good right there. Now that'll preach. That's good. That's wonderful. So the next time you die, it'll be Jesus. It'll be Jesus. That's right. It won't be because they knocked you out with paddles 85 times or however many times they hit you with that thing. It'll be Jesus. The next time you're healed, it's Jesus. It's always Jesus. It's always, always, always. So what are we about, Grace Point? Jesus. We're about one single person. 
So the next time, you know, the next time somebody asks about, well, so what's your mission there at the church? <laughs> well, you just say, well, we've got these three core values, and we've got this love God, love people routine that we do every Sunday. We do that, and that's right, that's good, that's all that. But you know what we're really about? We're about one single person, and his name is Jesus. That's what we're about. So what's your goal? What's your goal? What's your goal down through uh, 2018? You got to have a goal, you know. You got to have a goal. You got to you got to you got to have a goal. You got to have a goal. Oh, to love Jesus. Don't you love him? <laughs> 